get us started here. So welcome to our webinar here. We are um, just going over some um, review material and some new fun facts about the labs for Novari Science. Um, so what we'll do here first is I'll go ahead and let you know a little bit more about kind of the process here. So um, you can follow along what we're up to and then we'll have John speak. Then after that, we'll do a question and answer session. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's both a chat box and there's also a Q&A box. So if you are able, if you can put um, your question in the Q&A box, that'll make it a lot easier, easier for us to find it. But if you put it in the chat box, I'll be monitoring that too. Um, but just if you can, just feel free to pop a question in there and we'll go over as many as we can. And if we uh, run out of time for questions, feel free to put your email in your question as well so that we can get back to you on something if we don't have time. Um, and then also we are recording the webinar as well. So if you um, would like that, it'll be emailed to you on Tuesday. So it'll be up on YouTube and you'll receive a link in your email. Um, but yeah, so I'll just give a little bit more information about John here and then we will go on ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, um, after receiving his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Texas A&M University, John Mays spent 14 years in industry in engineering and engineering management in the areas of electrical controls and telecommunication systems. Vocationally drawn toward the field of education, John acquired a MED in secondary education from the University of Houston in 1989 and subsequently completed 36 hours of graduate study in physics at Texas A&M. Shortly after joining the faculty at Regent School in Austin of, or in 1999, John began work on an MLA at St. Edwards University, which he completed in 2003. John served as the math science department chair at Regent School from 2001 until 2009. And when he became director of the laser optics lab at Regents, he founded Novari Science in 2009 and is the author and editor of numerous student science texts and teacher resources. In 2019, Novari Science became a part of Classical Academic Press, where John is now the Director of Science Curriculum, overseeing continued development in Novari Science Curriculum. So I will go ahead and stop sharing here, and I will hand it over to you, John. All right, thank you. Um, I now see that we have 66 people attending. That's terrific, and I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. I'm hoping that the presentation I'm going to give will um, leave plenty of questions for Q&A. We had someone emailing in just this morning asking if, uh, if I was going to be discussing the specifics of any particular experiments or if it was going to be a general presentation. Um, clearly, uh, in one hour, <laughs> it'll be general. Um, and, uh, but if I, I'm thinking we'll have plenty of time for Q and A. So anybody with specific questions that you would like to have me address, uh, feel free to put those in the Q and A box or, uh, the chat box and Megan will, um, proctor those to me at the end of the session. So I will now share my screen. I see we're up to 72 people. That's just great. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining me. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to initiate my slides, which takes a few seconds because there's a lot of data heavy pictures in this presentation. Um, all right, so um, you should be able to see that now. And uh, Megan can let me know if that's not the case. This is our um, agenda. So uh, on the first slide I'm going to show after this one is the um, just a list of all the printed references we have. There are nine of them that address experiments and um, a list of which courses they apply to. If if you want to screen capture that or um, just mark it for later. Uh, it's just, I'm not going to go through the list. It's just a list. And I'll show it at the end of the thing too. So if you need to see it again, uh, then we'll go through 
some general tips for experiments, and then I want to make four big points, the fourth of which is to review the literature and resources that pertain to each course, and then we will head to Q&A. All right, so with that, here's the list. If you want to screen capture it, uh, um, there are nine books that we have in print that pertain to the experiments. And the only comment I want to make about the list here is to note that number five, because this confuses a lot of people, I have a book that I wrote in 2012 or 13 called Favorite Experiments for Physics and Physical Science. And the title is not uh, is a misnomer because this book has nothing to do with our physical science class. As you can see in number five on the right, it applies to introductory physics, accelerated studies in physics and chemistry, and physics modeling nature. And we will talk more about it as we go. Let's go now to the six general tips that I would like to present. Uh, make um, notes if you'd like to ask a question about any of these, because these are things that I try to um, encourage uh, often uh, when customers email in and asking questions about how do I do this or that. Um, these, are, these are the six answers we <laughs> frequently give. First, uh, I encourage everybody, and I, I'm, I know I'm probably speaking mostly to homeschool people here, but I, I know uh, from the chat box list that we saw, there are a lot of school teachers watching too. So um, this, this varies depending on what context you're in, but um, certainly in a homeschool context, let the student lead and manage as much of the lab work as possible rather than the homeschool parent doing everything. This would include building jigs uh, like are used in Novari Physical Science, um, acquiring the apparatus and supplies, setting everything up, studying the procedure so that we know what we're gonna do and learning the safety considerations and the disposal uh, procedures if you're doing chemistry, everything like that. In a classroom context, that's it's harder to do this because classroom teachers, of course, the, a lot of um, responsibilities, and you're trying to be as efficient as possible. In the old days, you know, back when I was in school, the teachers often had laboratory assistants that were students who were off, had off periods who wanted to help in the lab. If your school allows for that, that's a cool idea. If you could get a student to help you set up or clean up after experiments. If you can, you should also have your own class of students who are doing the experiments set up and clean up as much as possible. Set, you know, all that stuff is part of the experimental process. And um, we're trying to teach, as I'll talk about in one of the big points, uh, the labs are about getting students to share and experience the experimental process and setting up and cleaning up is part of that. Number two, uh, do as many of the labs or activities as you can that apply to your course, but do not feel guilty if you have to skip one or two or more. Uh, everybody's life has their own challenges and uh, it's, you know, just don't feel bad about that. If you need to say, you know what, just can't do this right now, uh, let's move on or let's come back to it later, that's okay, that's okay. Number three, Sometimes people write in and say, uh, well, we just really couldn't do this one. You know, like to pick up the soul of motion lab in introductory physics, which requires a team of people to push a car up and down uh, while you take data. Uh, right, not everybody can pull a team together to do that. So if you have to, um, substitute something else. And um, there's tons of stuff on YouTube that you can find and uh, you don't, need to feel like uh, you're being <laughs> unloyal, disloyal to us when you do that. Um, I understand that everybody's got their own situation. Again, um, do what works for you. Uh, number four, uh, maintain the right perspective about labs that don't seem to work out the way you uh, thought they would. You know, things happen. Um, sometimes Sometimes people don't know really how to uh, do the, an experiment in a way that's going to make it successful. We, 
try to make our um, laboratory procedures, you know, explicit. But every now and then someone calls up and says, you know, this doesn't work. Um, so uh, we always appreciate hearing that so that we can find out what's going on in the uh, experimental procedure that uh, maybe got someone confused. Um, I remember a few years ago, someone was talking to us about an experiment in the chemistry books that um, I think it was uh, involving the dissolving boric acid, if I can remember correctly, one of the very early ones, uh, boric acid in water. And um, uh, on, the, on one page, it says that the solubility of this in the book, it says the solubility is basically negligible. And the person doing the lab couldn't get it to dissolve. And they, they thought that we uh, were, you know, just inconsistent saying on one place that it's insoluble and in another place, you know, you should dissolve it in water. Well, it turns out it's insoluble at room temperature, but not in boiling water. It, it is soluble in boiling water and the procedure was to do it in boiling water. So anyway, sometimes things like this aren't fully clear and uh, maybe we can help if you email us. But even if, you, if your experiment doesn't work out, uh, and you don't have time to follow up on everything, the thing to do is to um, have the student or students act like a scientist would act in the same circumstances. Um, what would they do? They would document what they did. And if they're, you know, we're in a research lab where they had to submit a report about the results of their work, they would submit the report. So have them write up the report and explain what happened, what went wrong, what they think was going on, you know, in other words, do what real scientists would do in such uh, an, uh, an occasion. And number five, as probably everyone knows, but in case you don't, uh, homesciencetools.com does sell a materials kit for all our courses for the labs. And uh, we are not associated with them commercially. Uh, they just make kits uh, to go with different publishers Ex, uh, experimental uh, books, and they have kits for all of ours. Um, they're not cheap, but if if the price is accessible to you, it can save a lot of time if you uh, want to take advantage of them. And number six, um, starting in ninth grade, our expectation is that all students will be writing five to six full lab reports from scratch on their computer every year, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Uh, and that, re that is for every class, regardless of whether you have a book like the uh, chemistry uh, for, for uh, chemistry experiments for high school, where there are short form report places that students can fill in, or the apprentice's companion for biology, which also has places in the book to put in uh, data and answer questions. Even if you're using one of those, Five or six times a year, students should be directed to write a full-scale lab report. And for this, they need the student lab report handbook to uh, learn what to do. Starting in ninth grade, by the time they get to 10th grade, they should know what to do. And they should still have their copy of the lab report handbook that they can refer to as they perfect their uh, art of writing lab reports. But this is the whole idea here is to have a four year apprenticeship at writing lab reports so that by the time they get done with high school, they go off to college knowing this skill very well and able to write good lab reports in their college science classes. Now let's go to the big points. Big point number one. Demonstrations are great and necessary, but they are not real experiments. Sometimes people ask me this question that I'm uh, showing over on the right. Why are our experiments so complicated? Why is there so much apparatus? Um, other publishers, uh, if you look at their experiments, uh, you know, they're much more simple. Why can't you be guy guys be like that? Well, I have looked at uh, some other publishers' experiments, and uh, you know what? A lot of them are demonstrations, they're not experiments. A real experiment at least in physics and chemistry, uh, is about taking data and 
if you are going to take data and predict, make a prediction from your experimental setup, and then use your data to see if your prediction uh, was uh, supported by the data. In other words, you make a hypothesis, maybe it's numerical and like how much gas will be produced if we do this reaction and we collect the gas over water, we measure its volume. And now we got to compare that uh, result to the hypothesis. Well, doing this requires a lot of apparatus and not only just stuff, it has to be sophisticated enough apparatus so that you can collect data that are accurate enough and precise enough so that you can uh, see what happens. Uh, and that is just not easy to do. I have full articles on this. So if you want to get more background on this issue, um, this uh, blog post, this picture on the right is from the blog post itself which is on the old Novari science and math.com website under the blogs tab. You can find that there. It's still up. And um, if you have either of the chemistry experiments books like chemistry for uh, ex experiments for high school at home, page three, there's a, uh, you know, basically the same information is there, uh, experiments versus demonstrations. A demo, you know, you pour baking soda into, or rather vinegar into baking soda and you watch it, watch it make CO2 bubbles. That's a demo. No one's collecting data. It's very simple and cheap to do. If you want to make an experiment out of, out of that, you would have to measure the mass of the baking soda. You would have to measure not only the volume of your uh, vinegar, but you would have to know the specific concentration of acetic acid in that vinegar, which is not so easy to find out. You would have to um, then uh, collect the gas over, you know, using a technique like collecting a gas over water, which requires a whole bunch of apparatus and uh, in order to find out how much CO2 was produced by that reaction. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to an actual experiment. So that's why these experiments do involve more apparatus. All right, moving along. Big point number two. This does not come up very much, but I uh, would like to make a big deal out of it because it is a big deal. And we, chemistry and physics and uh, other science teachers, we need biology. We need to um, have this in our mind as we think about what we're trying to accomplish when we do experiments. The learning objectives for experiments are different from those for, uh, that apply to regular classroom instruction. Now, I first started thinking, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a long time, this list of learning objectives for a secondary science lab program that you can see on the right. Well, at least that's the first part of it. I think there are a total of 21 or 22 items in that list. That is in the student lab report handbook, which I wrote in 2009. So I've had this in mind for a long time, but I had got a new take on it a few years ago, maybe five years ago or so, six, seven, something like that. Physics Today had an article on uh, uh, surveying science teachers in high school, uh, I think, or college, and um, asking the question, you know, what's the purpose of the lab? And, uh, and does do the labs uh, support that? Well, the answer was, it seemed like most people thought that the purpose of the labs was to reinforce what students were learning in the classroom. The regular classroom instruction and second that that wasn't really happening so the question the reason the article proposed was um what do we do about that how can we make them more so they do reinforce but my answer to that question was that's not their job to reinforce what the classroom instruction is all about the labs are for um teaching things that you can't learn from a book like taking accurate measurements the skill of doing that, or holding apparatus in a way that they don't break, or uh, forming a hypothesis and seeing if the data support the hypothesis, which requires a process of learning how to uh, analyze data after you've collected it. So all these kinds of things, that's what the experiments do. They give students practice at doing the things that you can't learn in a book. That's why our new um, laboratory manuals for the life sciences that we're producing are called 
the apprentice's companion for general biology or the apprentice's companion for uh, life science is because the process of doing these experiments is just like the old being a, an apprentice where a master is showing you how to do this by hands-on being there with you, showing you how to do it. Uh, and here are a couple of references, the student lab report handbook pages, uh, Roman numeral nine and 10, that's where these learning objectives are found. They're also listed and described and discussed a couple of places in my book, From Wonder to Mastery. That's what FWTM means. Big point number three is uh, just a little more specific than big point number two. Focus on the data. The data are the most important part of the experiment. And that means making accurate measurements so that you acquire good data and accurately recording the data um, in the original units of measure, not you know, something else where you're converting units on the fly, but in the original units so that someone can see what data you actually collected. And then also more on data, uh, you were focusing on tables of data and setting them up properly so that we have our data recorded in a way that makes sense. I saw someone refer to doing the pendulum lab uh, in the chat box. Of course, the pendulum lab is really <laughs> there for two reasons. Learn how to take data and present it in tables and uh, learn how to start learning how to write a lab report. It's fun that we learn about pendulums also, but that's not the learning objective. Uh, also, setting up graphs and making graphs. As you see here on the right, I'm showing this image from Novari Physical Science, page 41, where before the first experiment, we're introducing the students to the idea of a scientific graph. Uh, and this is happening in seventh grade before they've maybe learned the Cartesian coordinates in their math class. So we're introducing them to this. It's a way of sneaking some quantitative stuff into that course before the math actually starts in chapter eight. So uh, uh, that's, that's graphing is a big part of it. And of course, analysis means looking at the graphs usually because you can't really analyze tables so easily. I mean, you can calculate percent differences and then use that as part of your analysis, but um, graphs are very helpful for analysis. And then of course, we're gonna do all this and write up a report, which is one of the goals of uh, doing labs is to learn that skill, the skill of writing a, a proper lab report. These are all key aspects of the experimental process and they all focus on data. Big point number four is, uh, to look at the specific uh, resources that apply to each course. Uh, that picture there that I'm showing, uh, no one's ever seen before because I just took that picture a couple, uh, like yesterday when I was finishing this talk up. And that is my own shelf of every book that we have in print. And um, there are a lot of them. As you can see in the middle, uh, we have all the uh, experiment and solutions manuals. Uh, most of them are in the middle there, except for favorite experiments, which is over toward the right. Uh, and the chemistry ones, the, oh, and you know all the oversized books are all over on the right. Uh, but as you can see, there are lots of books. And so um, it's important to get a grip on which ones apply to your course and which ones don't. So let's go through this and then we will head toward Q and A. All right, at the top, this is my standard way of uh, displaying our program. Currently, there are nine books in our program going from sixth grade to 12th grade. There are two more that are coming in the yellow boxes, advanced biology next year and environmental science in 25. As you can see, there are two pathways starting in ninth grade, a grade level path and an accelerated path. And, um, and we only have one book for anyone in grades six, seven, and eight, and then the paths split starting in ninth grade. Across the bottom of this slide are the seven uh, experiment books that we have in print right now. So I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna start with sixth grade. And while I'm doing a life science book, I'm gonna hit all the life sciences since they all use the same apprentice's companion concept. And then we'll back up 
and go through in order, great order, uh, all the other classes. So to begin, here's life science. So here's what we can say about the life science uh, experiment world. First of all, uh, this book, The Apprentice's Companion for Life Science, is the main thing you need. It includes 26 activities. Some are short, some are long. There's a lot of the variety in the different types. You need one copy of this for each student. And if you're a classroom teacher, you need one for yourself, obviously. Homeschoolers can make use of one copy for everybody who's involved. Uh, and then we have these additional resources that teachers will need, home or classroom, doesn't matter. These are in the My Library account when you buy The Apprentice's Companion. Uh, there's a document called Teacher Notes. There's a materials list. And there are three different sets of uh, tables or, or sheets that you can cut up or, or otherwise use for uh, activities 5, 18, and 28. So you need to get all that stuff to accompany your course. Now, while we're on uh, Apprentice's Companion, let's hit the other course that uses an Apprentice's Companion. That's General Biology. This course has 36, this book has 36 activities. Again, some are long, some are short. Each student and each classroom teacher needs a copy of the book, ACGB, I call it, Apprentice's Companion. And this course occurs in high school, which means the students also need their copy of the Student Lab Report Handbook, which I'm showing over on the right. Uh, that book does not apply to any particular course. It applies to all high school science courses. And uh, each uh, the teachers will additionally need these uh, resources that are, again, in the My Library account at the CAP website for the Apprentice's Companion book. And they are a document of teacher notes, much more extensive in this case than in the case of life science. Uh, I'm in the materials list, and there's a video there on how to make a fermentation tube. And just to finish off, while we're on the life sciences, when we get to the last two that are coming in the future, uh, we intend to publish Apprentices Companion volumes for those two courses as well. Now, backing up, let's resume where we were back in middle school. Seventh and eighth grade courses, that's Novari Physical Science and Earth Science, um, use the same setup for their um, experiments. And I didn't say this, I forgot to say it back when I was getting started on this big point number four. And that is, um, in case anybody's wondering why in the heck we do it differently, the experiments for every different course, why, why are there so many different ways of doing this? It's because uh, I did not plan this whole curriculum out back in 2009 when I started this company. And I didn't even know I was going to be doing all these texts in 2009. I didn't know that until about 2013. By then, we already had two books out, and I was starting on, on the chemistries. And um, so the whole program grew organically as we went through the years and as I thought about what would work for different courses and we ended up with different experimental programs for different courses that's just what we ended up with so for seventh and eighth grade though these two classes are similar um, the instructions for the students are in the book and there is no lab book per se there's an experiment manual for the teachers, which is a PDF that's included in the digital resources package that you buy to go with, or that teachers buy to go with their courses. Um, in the case of physical science, there are 12 experiments in that book, and there are eight in the earth science book. For both courses, you need to go to the textbook product page on the CAP website and click on support and you will see that there are other documents and resources there to support those experiments. Um, and then for Novara Physical Science, finally, uh, over on the right, I'm showing an image uh, of the so-called special parts kit. There are, this is a set of jigs that is used in the experiments. Then I think five of the 12 experiments use 
some of the components from this set of jigs. Uh, two of the experiments use the metal parts that are in that little insert picture at the bottom. Two of the experiments use the uh, up and down adjustable support stands that are shown on the right. And then uh, one experiment uses the clamp block on the left at the top, and, the, and uh, there's another experiment that uses the spring block in the lower left. There are instructions in the experiment manual PDF file for how to make these out of wood, which I used to do before we got hooked up with the 3D printer. I made these out of wood and out of metal myself for many years. And um, so the instructions of how to make them out of wood are in the, that manual. And, and I do encourage teachers, particularly homeschool uh, families, if you have access to someone who has tools and, and, and knows how to use them safely, it's great to get people to build their own stuff. It'd be a lot of fun. All right, moving along. The next grade we come to is a ninth grade. What I'll say here applies to introductory physics as well as accelerated studies in physics and chemistry. These courses are very similar and the experiments for them are very similar and they're handled in a, in a similar way. In introductory physics, there are five experiments. There are six in ASPC, and the five of them are exactly the same as, well, nearly, as the experiments for introductory physics. Um, the ASPC course has one extra one, which is on solubility, uh, which is covered in ASPC, but not in intro physics. Now, for both these two courses, the student instructions are in the appendix in the textbook. These are also, in case you didn't know, available as PDF files, these student instructions, in uh, the My Library for Favorite Experiments. That's the book with the misnomer title, remember? It does not apply to physical science, but it does apply to these two courses and our senior course, Physics Modeling Nature. Um, the student, each student starting in ninth grade also needs their own copy of the student lab report handbook because they're going to use it all the time. Uh, now, the teachers also need one of these two resources, either a copy of favorite experiments for physics and physical science, which includes all 65 or so demonstrations and all 12 laboratory experiments that apply to any of these three courses, introductory physics, accelerated studies in physics and chemistry, and physics modeling nature. That book has everything in it for those three courses. Or if you don't want to spend the money for that larger book, you can get the subset of the book, the extract, which is the book shown in the middle with the white and blue cover, called Experiments for Intro Physics and ASPC. This has in it only the laboratory information that teachers need for the six experiments that occur in one or the other of those two classes. All right, let's go next to the chemistries. Again, these are handled similarly for both the chemistry classes. Um, first thing to know is that we have two different chemistry experiment books, chemistry experiments for high school and chemistry experiments for high school at home. Most people won't need both. Some people may want both, as I'll mention in a moment. But the blue one, CEHS, that's based on schools that have Bunsen burners and so on in their labs. The red one for high school at home doesn't make that assumption. It assumes you're going to be using your stove top or your uh, maybe an alcohol burner, but it will not assume that you have a vacuum pump or anything like that. The experiments, though, are very, very similar. There is one in the high school book that simply doesn't apply to home people because uh, the contents include things that are precursors for meth labs and we just decided it wasn't a good idea for families to be buying that stuff, so we took it out. That's why there's one less experiment in that book. Uh, 
Each student in your class needs a copy of whichever book you're using. And if you're a classroom teacher, you obviously need your own copy. Um, experiments like number nine include a big calculation process that students have to go through. And uh, I was asked recently, like a year or two ago, um, if we had a solutions manual for these books, and we do not, but I started one. And the experiment nine was the thing the teacher was asking about at that time. And so I wrote up a full solution to the calculations for experiment nine. And I started this new document the um, you know solutions manual to go with these. But I don't really have time right now to just sit down and write it. So what I'm doing is when people need me to write something up and they email in and say, can you do this calculation for this other experiment? I will do it. I will add it to this PDF and I will send it to you. So if anybody needs that right now, just email us. And uh, we don't have this PDF posted anywhere yet, but it's available. Uh, again, each student needs their copy of the student lab report handbook, which they bringing with them from ninth grade. Now, the final point here is that um, if you're a classroom teacher using the blue book, you may also want a copy of the red book. This depends on your own level of experience. The red book includes um, a long discussions of safety, chemical storage, waste disposal, preparation of standard solutions and things like that, that the blue book does not contain. When I wrote the blue book, I was assuming this person would have a degree in chemistry and uh, would be well experienced in running chemistry labs and they know all that stuff. But if that's not you, if you didn't come about teaching chemistry that way, and I know people who didn't, you know, they, you may not know all this information that a person with a degree in chemistry would know. And the Red Book would be a good resource for you. For example, at the end of every experiment in the Red Book, there is a section on proper disposal of the waste. Those comments are not in the Blue Book. It might be helpful for you to have both if you are up to speed on all the regulations associated with and proper procedures associated with disposal of chemical wastes and possibly hazardous to uh, things like rivers and life, life or organisms and stuff that live out in the rivers. Um, and then finally, we come to physics modeling nature. Uh, there are five experiments for this text. They are not in the text, all right? They are, um, I'll get to where they are. Uh, the students need a copy, their copy of the lab report handbook. And then there are two places where the experimental descriptions that the teachers need can be found. One is in favorite experiments. I've already discussed that. And the other is in the extract, which is the white and purple book, which contains only the five labs for physics modeling nature. That's all it has in it. Now, for the students to use the instructions they need, uh, those are PDF files that are on in the uh, My Library account for um, favorite experiments. And that's where you can get them. You can also photocopy them in uh, either of the books because they're in there as well. If you bought the less expensive book, the extract experiments for physics modeling nature, and you don't have favorite experiments, well, I would suggest then just photocopy the page that has the student instructions on it and use that. I wouldn't mind. That is it. As promised, here again is that list of all these printed references and which courses they apply to. I'm going to leave this here for one minute in case someone's fumbling with their computer or their phone and you want to get this uh, captured for your own reference. Go ahead and capture it. And then I will stop the share. And uh, while we're getting ready for that, I'm going to now ask Megan to start firing questions.
Perfect, sounds great. Thank you so much for your talk and thank you everyone for coming out. Um, let's see, so, and also thank you to everyone who asked questions. And if we can't get to yours, just feel free to pop your email in there and we'll be sure to do our best. Um, so uh, John, the first question here, um, it says, I had a major, oops, I own the second edition of introductory physics, but accidentally purchased the complete solutions and answers for introductory physics third edition. Um, does this person need to return it and try to find the second edition? And kind of summing that up with some others, what are the compatibilities between um, different editions like? Yeah, um, no, uh, you're good. They go together well enough. Um, I, almost nothing changed. The, the, uh, the complete solutions and answers, uh, the more recent your printing is of that, any errors that have been brought to my attention have been corrected. But there are no big differences between the problem sets in the different editions of introductory physics or any of our other books. So, uh, in fact, to answer the more general question about our new editions, all new editions do is correct errors. I haven't made any substantial changes to any book, with the exception of the uh, two chemistry books and the senior level physics book. Uh, after 2019, in 2019, the metric system underwent some significant revisions, and uh, I updated those three books to take into account those new uh, standards, and that involved some pretty significant changes, but it didn't, it still, it didn't change the problem sets except for the few problems in those books that use a high degree of precision, where you get out to the sixth or seventh decimal place because that's where the new definition of the mole at Avogadro's number uh, kicks in. Uh, so. Awesome, thank you. And let's see, the next one here, um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, I'd love to see, or Leah Willis, says, I'd love to see teacher samples for all the junior and senior labs with detailed suggestions for error analysis. Are you considering making such a resource? She'd love to see what? Um, let's see. Um, sa teacher samples for junior and senior labs with suggestions for error analysis. Well, the student lab report handbook contains in the back of it four sample lab reports that contain that kind of uh, they contain a section on discussing the data, which is directed toward error analysis. And one of them is done uh, including error bars, which would be a thing you would only use in a junior or senior context. Um, so I think um, that's, as far as I know, that's all you need. You need to see some examples of what reports look like with this kind of analysis. And there's also in the student lab report handbook an extended discussion in one of the later chapters of error analysis. So everything I have to say about that is in the student lab report handbook. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Terry McLellan asks, what is the rationale for putting life science in sixth grade in their school? They start with earth science. So anything regarding sequencing, it would be awesome. All right. The rationale is this. There are three common courses that are used in middle school, life, earth, and physical. You got to fit them in somewhere because that's what everyone does. Uh, it's also the case that in many schools, there are only two grades in middle school. So what we have is everybody doing two grades and they have three sciences and they have to pick. And, uh, I wanted to have all three, and some people use life science in seventh grade. My old school where I taught, that's what they do. They don't have physical science in middle school, so they do life followed by earth, and then they go to the high school program. When I tried to think this out, here's what I decided. If I were running the school, I would want to do all three of these, and life science has virtually no math in it, which makes it suitable for sixth grade. Uh, and it's also a place where you can get a lot of organ systems uh, information that does not occur in the advanced biology book later on the road for the students in the accelerated track. So that's the rationale. We have three courses. 
Uh, Got to put them somewhere. If you want to change the sequence, a lot of people do. So do as you need for that. Thank you. Uh, Ashley Bozard asks, how does the format for writing lab reports in the student lab report handbook compare to the format in which students will write in college? Huh. Um, before I forget, um, I, 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 well, okay. I'm just looking at some of these questions that are in the chat box that are I can answer quickly. Someone says, is dotted quadrille paper okay? For taking data or writing in your uh, notes, yes, but a lab report is a printed document from a computer that is on white printer paper. Uh, and what does a lab report for grades six, seven, or eight look like? Um, what I say in various things I've written about that is like the uh, teacher preference to the book is uh, there's not a formal report in those grades. Usually you would have the students do the questions that are in the thing, and then you would have them um, practice writing a piece of the report. So you might wanna get a copy of the lab report handbook and have them try their hand at writing a procedure for this lab or uh, presenting data for this other lab. Uh, now, back to the question at hand. Um, remind me quickly what it was, Megan. Um, the question asks how the format for writing lab reports in the student lab, lab report handbook oh, yeah. compares, compares to, to college. Format for college. Yes. Uh, very well. The only, uh, in fact, the second edition of the lab report handbook, the, the edits that I put in there are specifically because of what I heard from colleges. Uh, one college was considering adopting the student lab report handbook for their own science program. And the only reason they didn't is because I didn't require students to write the procedure in passive voice. And I didn't direct students to uh, put the title of a table above the table in the center of the page. They said their standard was titles for tables go above the table in the center of the page. Whereas my standard was put titles for both figures and tables under the thing and or left justified. Uh, I thought that was a silly reason not to use my book because you could easily just tell the kids, look, for tables, put the title up here. But that was their decision. But anyway, other than that, they said, this is exactly what we tell our students to do, what you have in this book. I also hear from students all the time when they come home. It's one of my favorite st and, uh, standard stories to tell because uh, this happened like eight years in a row while I was teaching uh, at the homecoming game. Student would come home from college find me at the game and say, Mr. Mays, you'll never guess what happened to me. And after this happened a few times, of course, I was able to say, well, yes, I can guess. Uh, you wrote your first lab report in your college lab and the TA came back with the stack of graded papers and said, these are all rubbish except for this one. Uh, who wrote this report? And that was me, Mr. Mays. And he said, how did you know how to do this? And she says, because I learned it in high school. Where did you go to school? All right, so I've had that same conversation so many, many times. Uh, the lab, student lab report handbook, teaching students how to write and, and compelling them, requiring them with their grades and your instruction to prepare the reports exactly the way the book explains with pedantic fixation on the formatting rules for figures, graphs, titles, et cetera, is really good stuff. And it will pay for itself down the road. I had a student one year get a summer job between junior and senior year, working for the state water control or water quality board, the state board that looked at the water quality in streams. And his uh, supervisor took him out in the field and told him that he would be writing reports of his findings. And as they got into the details of that, the, the uh, student said, oh, well, I already know how to do that. Uh, they've taught me that in high school. And he was ready to go with his summer job. He didn't have to learn how to write a lab report. All right. So next question. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one question asks, what student would be best suited for the advanced track? Can you speak a bit about the difference? What kind of math is included and um, algebra? as well? 
Um, of course, this decision starts in ninth grade when the tracks split. And um, the uh, idea is that um, the grade level track, the students will be in ninth grade taking algebra one. In the accelerated track, they will have already completed algebra one in their previous year. And they'll be in geometry, most of them, if they're on the accelerated track. In my experience, it takes more than advanced math placement to be a candidate for being in the accelerated science track. Uh, as you go up in the courses, these courses get substantially more difficult than the courses in the grade level track. And it's simply not enough to just be, you know, in the accelerated math. You need to have, you need to be a person who wants the more rigorous course because this is what I want to do. And they have to have the work ethic to go with that. We all know, right? We all know these are kids that are going through, they're developing, they're, they're 13, they're 14, now they're 15, now they're 16. They often misjudge their own um, abilities, character, and so on. So the teacher is looking at them, the parent is looking at them. If someone is smart, but extremely lazy, well, they shouldn't be in the accelerated classes. They will have a hard time. And if someone is very diligent, but um, you know, really on the edge when it comes to math, I also wouldn't put that person in the accelerated program. And in there, I would put people who have demonstrated abilities to operate it at an honors or accelerated level, and they have the uh, diligence and the work ethic and so on that they've already demonstrated that, look, I'm the kind of person who can do this and third, I want to be a person doing this. I know it's going to be hard. I want the hard. Give it to me. That's the kid that goes in the accelerated courses. Um, the, the, two, the two tracks are rather different. And uh, the higher you go, the courses differ more and more. General chemistry is a solid class, but it's not AP chemistry. Our accelerated chemistry book is AP chemistry. Ditto for the biologies. The advanced biology is AP biology. The regular biology is not. And the senior level physics book, Modeling Nature, it is hard. I know that because I taught it 13 years, more than that, and uh, just 13 in one school, but I taught it before that. It's hard. I made it hard on purpose. These are kids who uh, think they want the tough stuff and they're going into engineering or sciences. They need the hard stuff. That's what has, that's the book that has it. So uh, hopefully that helps. Another question stemming from that one asks, um, going more generally from their question, uh, Deirdre Logan asks, does the accelerated physics and chemistry course cover the same material as the general subjects as fully? In other words, would we miss anything by going the accelerated route? So regarding any accelerated program, is the content the same or what are people missing if they choose to accelerate? Okay, um, that depends on the grade level. Let me give you a quick rundown. In ninth grade, the two books are Intro Physics and ASPC. Um, ASPC contains everything Intro Physics does, plus much more, all the chemistry stuff, with one exception. In intro physics, there's a chapter on momentum. That's not in ASPC, all right? ASPC students are the students who are likely to take uh, physics modeling nature when they're a senior. Momentum is actually a pretty boring subject and it can be learned really quickly. So I left it out of ASPC because if those students end up in their senior class where they're using vector methods to solve problems, well, that's where momentum problems get really exciting and difficult. So you, it only takes two seconds to introduce the concept of momentum. It's mass times velocity, okay, bing. So the rest of it is learning how to solve the problems, which are much more interesting when you can use vectors, which is not happening in ninth grade. So that's the difference between intro physics and ASPC. Momentum is left out of ASPC, but ASPC has a lot of stuff in it for chemistry that IP doesn't have. Going to the chemistries, uh, as I already said, uh, there are two advanced chapters in chemistry for accelerated students, namely thermal chemistry and chemical equilibrium that are not in general chemistry. 
those advanced topics are in the AP syllabus and they're hard. Uh, there's also a bonus chapter in the advanced chemistry book on organics, in introductory to organic chemistry, uh, just in case anybody wants to use it. It would not be part of the normal school year. Going to the biologies. Uh, advanced biology is a biochemistry book. It will not have anything in it about plants and animals and human organs. So all that plants and animals and human organ stuff that's in the general biology book, it's not in advanced biology at all. That's why it is in life science, those things. So you can learn general stuff about plants and animal reproduction and the parts of flowers and human organs uh, in life science. Uh, because in advanced biology, that book is a biochemistry book and it's, it con it's concludes every single topic that's in the AP syllabus. So it's, a, it's a AP biology plus the special things added in that Navari wants to add, like um, history, uh, worldview stuff, um, and so on. And then uh, I guess that's the only sets of books that we have for comparison. Um, if I wanted to compare the senior year though, just to finish off, we have our new environmental science book that's underway. It'll be out in, uh, in 25. That book is going to be suitable for every senior and obviously of interest to every senior since the planet right now is a key uh, if key interest to every single person. Um, so most students are going to have to choose between environmental science or if they're on the accelerated track and want a really hard physics course, they'll probably have to choose one or the other. Some students in some curricula or programs might be able to work in both. It depends on what your other requirements are, obviously. If I were a kid going into engineering, I would want to do both. So I would figure out how to do that. It might mean not taking Latin for the fourth year, you know, or something like that. Uh, but if, if I were going to study physics or uh, electrical engineering in college, I would try to do both. But um, only 10 or 20% of the students are going to end up in physics modeling nature. Everybody else is going to end up taking the environmental science class their senior year, which is accessible to everyone. It's, uh, again, the AP syllabus. So it also, like those other two books I mentioned, it covers everything in the AP syllabus for environmental science, plus the special things that uh, Navari will be putting in, such as a whole chapter on the theology of creation care and why it is right for us to care about the world God made rather than uh, mess it up. So there we go. Next question. Perfect. And this will probably be the last one since we're coming up on 1 p.m. Um, but uh, Diana Cruz was asking for any advice. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong person. Sorry. Um, the question is from Robin Larson. She asks if you have any advice for um, a homeschool family starting the curriculum for the first time, and also just for any teachers teaching this for the first time. Any big takeaways? Uh, <clears throat> yes, here's the takeaways. If you're doing any Navare work for the first time, you should definitely read From Wonder to Mastery. That book is a summary of my entire teaching model, which took many years to develop and which is at the heart of the way all these books are structured. That That, that book is my whole vision for how this teaching model works. So if you want to know what's going on, you definitely need to read that. It explains why the tests and quizzes are structured the way they are, why the courses are sequenced the way they are, uh, what mastery is all about, and how my mastery teaching model compares to the ones that are in the research going back to 1968, and, and so on. So that's essential. It's essential for anybody doing a Navari course to to read from wonder to mastery. That is essential, all right? The second thing that would be essential would be uh, watch this webinar so that you would know uh, all the ins and outs of doing the experiments because uh, a lot of people get confused by our bewildering array of experimental references and things. That's why we did this uh, webinar this year. And now that we have it, uh, people who are going through their course for the first time can watch it and kind of get the bearings on the lay of the land in our experiments. Oh, oh, one more thing, and that is uh, I have a whole lot of video that you can watch. I encourage you to watch them. At Classical U, which is CAP's teacher education program, I have three video courses there. 
Uh, one is teaching science classically, one is um, teaching for mastery, and one is uh, science and the symphony of creation, which kind of hits on all the things that go outside the book, like the worldview stuff, and, uh, and how important that is to bring into the classroom, or art, or, uh, you know, Socratic discourse into the classroom. I also have uh, lots of FAQ videos on the Navari website, or you can get to it from either website. And um, I also have a blog that is accessed from the CAP website. Go to resources and Navari blog. And I don't post there as often as I like to, but um, I do post a lot of things that are of general interest for science educators and particularly Navari science educators. So you can go to the blog page and sign up so you can get notifications when I post a new one and keep up with that if you're interested in my ongoing conversation. Anytime someone asks me a really uh, interesting question about our curriculum or my views about education or teaching or science, I try to turn it into a blog post. So that, that place is a place where the most interesting things that I've been thinking about, I, I publish. So stay up with those. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. I uh, really appreciate you coming out. And it's great to hear everything about the labs here. I am going to go ahead and share my screen real quick, just with a few of the uh, latest things from CAP and some other information that might be helpful for you guys. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen here. And I'll make it into a slideshow. So first, we just have some more information about the latest from Novari, which is life science. So if you are looking to do any middle school um, uh, middle school science classes, feel free to look into this and you can find at the link below classicalacademicpress.com slash Novari science. So if you are just getting your foot into science, feel free to look into that. And then also related to what John was saying, you can find his courses on science at classicalu.com. Um, as he mentioned, he has three of those, and I'll go ahead and include a link in the email I send you guys as well. Um, on Tuesday, when the recording comes out, I'll be sure to make sure you have access to John's classes. But Classical U is a platform with um, videos and uh, thought leadership or any exercises from people who are um, who are very experienced in the classical education field. So. You can hear from them on classicalu.com. Uh, and then the next one here is uh, Scholae Academy. So any homeschoolers who are looking to do any online classes or um, learn with some other students who are doing the same content, you can go to Scholae Academy. There is enrollment for 2023 already open. So feel free to look into those classes. There are also some science classes on there if you are interested in that. And, and then, of course, they so use Novari just, text. <laughs> yes, Novari text, yes. So feel free to look into that if you would like some help there. And then um, one of the last things we have here is um, Humanitas. So our next webinar will be next Friday at noon as well, um, noon Eastern. Um, it will be on our new upper school history text that teaches um, history through primary sources. So that will be with Chris Perrin, uh, Christopher Mayoka, and Nate Antiel. So it will be like a round table, but wanted to include this here so you can get a peek into that. And I'll be sure to include a link for that as well for you next week. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for coming out. And um, I'll just remind you real quick, the uh, recording will come an email to you. So if you missed some of this um, at the front end, we'll be able to receive that. But thanks everyone. If I didn't get to your question, feel free to shoot me your email, but I'll go ahead and um, end this here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you coming and I appreciate all your kind remarks over in the chat bar. I love you guys. See you in the future. Go with God. <laughs>